Hello everyone and welcome to our second video from the assessment playbook study where we are going to share some highlights with you from the topics we covered in February. We want to thank everyone that was able to join us for one of our two February synchronous meetings and we hope that you were able to take away some inspiration and ideas from those sessions. If you were unable to join us for one of those February synchronous meetings, please know that the recorded versions are linked in the Google Classroom under general resources in your assessment playbook study plan. During the month of February, we have been learning about enduring concepts known as assessment cookies in the distance and blended learning environment, as well as ways to make decisions about assessments in any setting. So for today's video, the success criteria we have is are one that you can make connections from what you read or to what you've heard in previous synchronous sessions to our provided topics from the first month's topics. And our second success criterion is that you can apply your learning from this topic study back in your school or district to positively impact student achievement. So let's take a look at that first success criterion and making some connections. So when we consider the highlights from chapter one, we have to acknowledge the role that assessment cookies play in distance and blended learning. Assessments are an important part of the teaching and learning process because they inform next steps for teachers and students. When we consider rigor, we have to look at the difference between difficulty and complexity as they are not the same. Difficulty measures the time, work, or effort required to complete a task. Its primary function is to identify how many people can complete the task correctly. Complexity, on the other hand, measures the thinking that is required to complete a task and may include background knowledge, relating pieces of information, or problem solving through multiple steps. If we want to provide rigorous assessments for students, we have to consider both difficulty and complexity. From our text and personal experiences, we know that assessments can come in all shapes and sizes. Any assessment can be used formatively or summatively. However, considering what you are assessing and how the assessment information will be used is important to remember when selecting the assessment type. If teachers and students are unsure of the purpose of the assessment, then we argue that the assessment is not appropriate to time or place. Assessment for learning is really that ongoing formative assessment process. It informs teacher practice and works to improve learning. Assessment as learning is all about supporting students in managing their own learning through self-assessment and goal setting, really fostering that independence and self-regulation. And lastly, assessment of learning, which is really that summative evaluation at the end of a period of instruction. It is used to make judgments about student performance or achievement and can take numerous forms such as a grade, level of achievement, or rubric descriptor. Assessment cookie three, knowing the learner and their learning journey. For those of you who participated, in our fall book study, the distance learning playbook, it really emphasized that in order to establish teacher credibility and build relationships with our students, we have to call on students by name. We have to know their interests and where they are in the learning journey. We can then use this knowledge of where students are to help accelerate their learning. With many schools and districts, coming out of pandemic teaching, we know that learning gaps are going to be a reality. They're all, those are always a reality in our classrooms, right? But when deficit thinking creeps into our minds, it can lead to lowered expectations. However, both the distance learning playbook and the assessment playbook for distance and blended learning stress the mindset of accelerating student learning, not continually remediating. Because let's be honest, most schools don't have the human resources to remediate all students, but we do have the means to accelerate learning. In regards to assessing that which is taught and teaching the standards, the learning intentions 
and standards serve as guideposts for our instruction and assessment development. We need to build assessment through the lens of teacher clarity. As mentioned before, we ultimately want students to be independent, self-regulated learners who can be drivers of their own learning. But to do that, we know students need to be able to answer those three clarity questions. And so the first of those, what am I learning? We use our learning intentions to help them answer that question. Why am I learning it? That's really that purpose or the relevance for students. And then finally, how will I know that I've learned it? So that's the success criteria that are the indicators of student learning. So now I'm going to turn it over to Misty to talk more about the learning intentions with Assessment Cookie 5. Assessment Cookie 5 states that students deserve to know what they should be learning. And one of the ways we help articulate this to our students is through learning intentions. Learning intentions help students to answer that first question of what am I learning today? Teachers create their learning intentions as they work together to analyze and break down the standards to determine exactly what they need to teach and assess to see if students have met the grade level expectation. When we use well-designed learning intentions in our classrooms, it invites students into the learning and allows them to establish their own goals around the intended learning outcomes. On page 20 in the text, the authors offer some considerations when creating learning intentions. We know that they should be written in student friendly language as well as from the student perspective. So you will also often see them phrased as we are learning to or I am learning about. They should include key concepts or vocabulary as well as a broad statement of what the students are actually learning. However, learning intentions should not be a checklist or an agenda of what tasks students will complete in a particular lesson. Assessment cookie six stresses that knowing your destination helps. So along with students knowing what they are learning, they need to be able to answer the question of how will I know if I've learned it? Students need to know when they have met the learning intention, and that is the purpose of success criteria. Well-designed success criteria should become the foundation for assessment because they are ultimately what we are assessing. They also guide the creation of assessment tasking tools. Success criteria can build in complexity over time. A single learning intention may have several success criteria associated with it. The success criteria can be scaffolded from the surface level to the deeper learning that is necessary for students to reach the full depth of the grade level expectation. Success criteria also help to communicate to both students and teachers where they need to focus their time and attention in a lesson. In the text, the authors provide some considerations when the developing success criteria. They should encourage students to show what they know and specify the evidence they will need to produce to demonstrate they know it. They should deconstruct the process of meeting the learning intention again in that scaffolded way and be written in student friendly language. So how do these different pieces all fit together into the bigger picture? When combined, standards, learning intentions, and success criteria help students navigate their way through learning. They also provide focus and direction to teachers as they design their assessment task. The learning intention provides students with the destination and the success criteria provide the checkpoints along the way. We use quality assessments to determine where students are in relation to the intended learning outcomes to see where they need to go next, and then we use feedback to help guide those next steps. Assessment Cookie 7 reminds us that everything is searchable, so we need to plan accordingly. We need to make sure that we don't limit assessment tasks to things that can be searched on the Internet. In order to keep students engaged in their learning and focused on meaningful assessment and evaluation, we have to consider how we can create assessments that require students to do more than simply find an answer. So assessment should include some task that requires students to search the internet and then do something with that information. The authors also talk about how there is a difference between surface deep and transfer learning and how we need to ensure that we align our assessments with the appropriate phase. Surface learning is where students are building the initial um, understanding of skills and concepts. Deep learning is where they're making connections and identifying relationships between the different skills and concepts that they've learned. With transfer, they're able to apply that learning to new situations and use it to help self-regulate self their learning. 
Students do move back and forth between surface and deep learning as they build their understanding over time. We need to make sure that our assessments accurately reflect the phase of learning that is being measured. And then our last assessment cookie. Assessment cookie eight is a caution that parents want to help, and sometimes that's a problem because they tend to want to overhelp. And overhelping is not a new problem. However, it has been amplified in the distance learning setting. Regardless of the learning environment, students deserve assessments that allow them to demonstrate their understanding with fidelity. And as teachers, we need to make sure that we are gathering quality, accurate information so that we can make sound instructional decisions. Part of this is helping to educate our parents. We want them to learn the language of learning and not be the homework police. So we need to teach our parents how to help their child and talk to parents about the value of valid assessment practices. On page 29 in the text, there is an example of a letter that teachers can use with parents to communicate the purpose of assessment and the need for students to experience productive struggle. So that when students do take an assessment, it is a true reflection of where they are at that moment in time. As always, please feel free to reach out to either me or Carrie if you have any questions or if we can support you in any way. Thank you for watching this rapid video of section one on assessment cookies.